if you take that challenge out there and you're really curious about it, you can, you know, you can mentor with your local pro. You can sign up to an online school. You can, uh, you know, yeah. make a group of friends that are interested in the same thing. You're listening to Art Heroes Podcast, the show to help you thrive as a digital artist. Tune in to learn how to transform your passion into a career. Get inspired by other kick-ass 2D and 3D artists and find out what it takes to be an art hero. All right, we are now live. Sergio, thank you for coming on the show and welcome to the Art Heroes podcast. Glad to have yes, you. Yes, I'm happy to be here. It's going to be <laughs> a really fun chat, I hope. Definitely, definitely. All right, guys. So uh, again, happy to introduce Sergio Pius here. Uh, and today we're going to have an episode full of storyboarding insights. And I'm really, really excited about that. As I already told Sergio, he's the first one pioneering uh, storyboarding on Art Heroes podcast. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. And uh, yeah, uh, Sergio, why don't we just start with you? Um, can you maybe just uh, introduce yourself a little bit more in like detail, like uh, where what you do now and uh, where did you start from? Yes. Uh, well, thank you for having me. For one, I, I, I guess I should talk about um, kind of what I do. So I, I consider myself a story artist. And for a long time, I've been in story development in the story departments at uh, kind of animation studios and film studios. So I worked at Pixar and Lucasfilm and Sony and, and video games and films and movies, TV shows, all of that stuff. And then uh, now recently, later in my career, I've become a director. So I've directed a couple of uh, animated uh, TV series and done some of that, which was the Star Wars Rebels project at Lucasfilm and also the Star Wars Resistance project. Um, I was also on the Clone Wars, which for the Star Wars fans out there, they'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and um, so I've always been in the kind of the graphic arts and developing story and storyboarding. Now, for, for those out there who may not be familiar with this kind of thing, basically what we do is we take uh, the story ideas and we break them down into images. And by doing that, we use you know, the typical graphic things that you would do. So now it's all digital, so we do it like in Photoshop, and we create 2D images that are kind of sequential art. So think of like a comic book, and we're gonna break down a story in individual images, and we do that for the whole story. So if it's a short or a TV episode or a whole feature movie, which is two hours long, we're gonna do the whole thing in images, and that way we can see the kind of shots and the camera work and the cinematography that we're gonna use in the story. We're also developing characters, and we're thinking about the structure of how things hit and the timing. And so you're really, you're wearing a lot of hats as a story artist, so to speak. And I think that's why I, I, I'm also getting into doing direction because I think being in the story department, it kind of, you see the process and you, you get to be part of that whole thing. And so you understand how it works. And so leading that way, you can kind of uh, help others and guide people and then eventually you know, go on to supervise things. Um, I've always been a kind of like a traditional 2D artist. I started out as an animator. Um, you know, I did the whole art school thing and stuff. I'm a big fan of Art Heroes, by the way. <laughs> so I'm really glad oh, you guys you. <laughs> are doing what you're doing. Yeah. And I think it's great that um, there's so many cool, diverse things out there. And then all of it's valid. So whether you're doing uh, digital stuff, you're doing like traditional stuff or sculpture or any kind of like all the way in between, I like to think of it is that we're all storytellers and that we shall all understand what we're trying to do to communicate an idea to, to our audience basically. Um, so uh, anyway, that was a little bit of a, a random summary yeah. of what I do, but I, you know, I, most of the time I've been, I grew up in the United States. I, uh, for most of my career, I've been based out of California and uh, worked in, I've worked actually all over. I've been working in Europe uh, for a while, but um, mainly I, you know, when I went back to Pixar and stuff, I was all like California in the San Francisco Bay area. And uh, as a side note, too, and this is one of the reasons why I love Art Heroes and how we met, is I also run an online educational platform to teach people how to do this stuff, which is called Storyboard Art. So most people can find me there and, uh, and see some of the things that we've done on that, on that way. That's a pretty complete introduction. Thanks, Sergio. <laughs> like, uh, um, let's then uh, go a little, a little bit in, in detail in uh, storyboarding. 
can you help me understand it? And actually, I really don't know. So educate me, please. Uh, yes. in, like, what's the what part of the production pipeline storyboarding falls into? Is it like, you know, step zero or closer to step two, three? Um, so, yes. because you mentioned that it's a complex process and I've seen a few animatics and uh, it's just really detailed uh, sometimes. So when yeah, it, does this whole thing happen? It all depends on the project, but this is one of the cool things about being a story artist or being in like, in the development process. So visual, visual artists as well are also included in kind of like the art department, so to speak. And so story guys like myself and, and visual development artists, concept artists and stuff will all kind of be in the art department. But th what I love about this as story guys, we, we tend to be at the beginning of the project. Now it can be in different phases. For example, you could have an idea that gets, you know, has a writer or a director involved and they have a script and they do that whole process. But once that happens, that's usually when they start talking to development artists and concept people and mm -hmm. story guys like myself. So we are really close to the beginning of most of these projects. That's where it becomes really, really fun. Um, so for example, I, I've been personally hired by directors and writers like right at the beginning. So right when they are uh, developing a project and constructing the story and they just might have development funds, for example, and then after a while it gets greenlit and, and more people come on to the project. So you're really close to uh, like the beginning of it so this would be considered pre-production in the phase and then also the cool thing about this is you have the opportunity to influence the project this is the really cool part about being a story guy is that you have um a, you know you have a lot of uh yeah i'll just say influence because what happens is you'll get a let's say you get a typically you get a script and a written breakdown of what the story can be then uh, as a story person, you're the one breaking down that in images and you're interacting directly with the directors and the writers and the key creative people at the beginning of those projects. Then you can think, you continue developing that stuff and you have the, you have the, um, the opportunity to like suggest ideas, to maybe manipulate some of the story structure, to select dialogue, to, you know, to add your own kind of personal flavor. Now, usually you do this with the guidance of the director and the writer and everybody else, because you want to have a style for the project. It's all going to be, you know, pretty similar. But that's the cool thing about being a story guy. You want to bring your own style, your own ideas, and you get to present things in images, which is really, really cool. So that, that's that. the one part. Yeah, that's that's the one part that like, um, and then you know, there's a there's a big gripe in the industry, I should say, that like, uh, and I think this probably goes for everybody, but I know since I'm a story person, I hear it a lot, is that like, we don't get enough credit, right? Oh, of <laughs> it's course. Like, right. And so it's always like, oh man, I wrote that. I actually, that was my idea, right? But nobody ever knows that it was you behind the scenes who actually <laughs> did something like that. So it's only like internally our guys um, will understand how that process is. So at Pixar, for example, there are many, there are many instances where they'll just like scribble an idea, like literally on the back of a, of a, a napkin, they hand it to some guy in the story department and they go, okay, go flesh this out. And then you're the one who has to conceptualize the idea from nothing, basically a couple of written words and you, you develop the story. So you have, so in order, we can get into like how you do this and what kind of skills and things you should, you should think about learning. So you get to this level. But that's really where the fun is. You, you get to be creative and use your imagination and you know, develop the project from there. Amazing. So actually, to me, it sounds like almost uh, a co-creation of, of, of a movie, of a project from words to something visual, like the first, very first stage of bringing it to the screen. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's almost like a, a second writing process because think, well, think about the, the end product for most narrative sequential Project. So it could be a TV show, it could be a video game, it could be um, you know, a TV commercial, anything like that. Um, it could even be like a YouTube video, whatever you want to do. The, the final product is a moving image that's timed yes. out with different shots, right? And in order to get to that final image part, you have to actually know what you're going to produce. This, this is especially true for like 3D animation or any kind of um, like labor intensive project. So any kind of animated thing or visual effects. You have to know exactly what your shots are going to be beforehand so you can hand it off to the animators and the visual effects guys. Exactly. And so because of that, that's where we come in as story guys. And we have, yeah, we have the opportunity to influence that, that end project. And it's with images. That's how we 
that's how we communicate our, idea, our ideas is mm -hmm. with drawing images. So we're using our art to create, uh, to communicate an idea and it's all just like a rough image. And, you know, we can, I'm sure you have an examples of stuff where people can like Google like storyboards and you'll see many examples. Yeah, we'll just put, pull them up on the screen right now if, if people okay. are watching YouTube and they will put it on the show notes as well. Great, yeah. Because you'll see there's a couple of things that they're very rough. They're very like a simplified version of what the final product would be. And that's mostly what you want to do is just because of speed, because you have to crank out these images really, really quickly most of the time. Um, and then and then now what a trend that's going on in the industry is that you'll compile these images into an animatic, which you mentioned, which is basically like a it's a timed out story reel or a motion video, right, with images. And you'll usually put temp dialogue and temp sound on it, but it gives a really clear idea of what your final product will be. So you can, you know, again, there's many examples of this stuff. If you look at like the behind the scenes of Pixar or DreamWorks or Disney or any of these big movies, you'll see uh, how the storyboard reels are influencing the final product. And even like visual, visual effects films, like Marvel superhero movies and stuff. So well. before animatics, what was there? Like, what was the visual representation of a of a storyboard? There was just like a, a bunch of images, like a slideshow. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah, they would literally pin them up on a wall, right? Like you'd be out there. Ah, okay, people, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, the storyboard. And, Thank you. Yeah, the storyboard. Hence the board, mm. right? That's, so it's a uh, that's the thing, and people would literally be there and they would pitch the ideas. Um, now every studio was different. Even in like a live action film, like Alfred Hitchcock was uh, famous for using. I think he either did his own boards or he had uh, you know story guys that he worked with and they would they would you know really draw out the the, the um, his films with little little images right so you never see the like the animatic that was produced because they wouldn't actually go to the length of filming it and timing it out although yeah. uh, there are some places that did even back in like the 50s and 60s so one of the famous places was like uh, the Disney Studios which is famous for carrying on this tradition. And that's kind of where, you know, a lot of people attribute the fact that, you know, there are story reels and animatics that, that came from the early Disney studios back in the 40s and 50s when, you know, Walt was alive and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so they kind of developed the process and, and with others as well to have these like story reels and animatics. But yeah, before they actually um, compiled them together, you would see you would see the boards, like tons, hundreds of images up on there. And you could actually kind of like, comp it's like a comic book, basically. Like you could watch these things yeah. and see how like the events would change over time. So how long do you think it could take or how long does it take now to produce a complete uh, product as of a storyboard? Yeah, that's a really good question. We get that, I get that question a lot. Is Of um, course. <laughs> yeah, no, because one of the, it, the obvious answer is it could vary depending on the project, but they're like the average like film, like you're talking about an animated film, like you know, Frozen or, or any kind of Pixar film. Uh, they usually have a team of people, story guys, with like maybe six to 10 guys on a team. Uh, and then there's story supervisors and directors and producers and stuff there too. But the actual artists, they're usually around six to eight, let's say. And it will take them like over a year, sometimes two, two years, two full years just to develop in images in a rough pass, the actual film right? <laughs> and we're talking oh my hundreds. God. Yeah. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of images. In fact, sometimes it's now in the thousands because what happens with, with the transition now in digital art, right? Is that as you can, as you know, I'm sure your audience is familiar, like in Photoshop and all these like programs, procreate, whatever it is that you're using, you can easily like duplicate and replicate um, images. So you can crank out a ton more storyboards than yeah. you used to be able to, because actually literally, and I started, I, I'm, I'm revealing my age here, but uh, I started in this business when we were still using photocopy machines, right? And so we would actually like take, go to the photocopy machine, cut out the drawing so you didn't have to redraw it. Like it was a shortcut. <laughs> uh -huh. You put it on the photocopy machine and you copy this thing, right? And you do it like 10 times. You go back to your desk, you copy and paste and you like, you tape it down. And then you would like Frankenstein a series of storyboards that you would show physically on paper to somebody else, right? Nowadays, you can skip the whole copying machine because you have like Photoshop and you can just duplicate, change it, scale it up, move it. And then what happens is you start exporting now instead of, let's say, a, a sequence at 100 panels, you have now 500 panels because you can do many more poses a lot quicker, right? And uh, that's where you see this trend now. If, if, if you guys look at the animatics, 
you'll see they're really, really detailed. I, in fact, some of them are actually almost like mini animations. They look yeah. really complex, you know? Um, and I invite everybody to see like, uh, like the, the animatics that were done for um, Iron Man, for example, or uh, the Avengers. Just do a Google search for that and you'll see how complex and how really elaborate you can get because you can also do 3D. You can start bringing in 3D elements and 3D backgrounds or 3D characters and, uh, and it just gets really, really, you can go, you can go crazy, right? <laughs> so it almost looks like a finished product. And um, that's kind of the trend now because the, the reason why, and I'll just mention it, is because uh, the closer you can get to a blueprint for what the finished product will be, the, the more complete and clear your story looks. And the, uh, directors like that and producers like that. So that's why they go through these elaborate lengths to get a really good story we know. Right. Interesting. So, you know, it just seems like the whole universe of storyboarding that I was not previously entirely aware of. And uh, like, you know, just like massive FOMO is hitting me right now. Yeah, well, it's not just you. Um, because <laughs> Like I said, nobody gives us any credit. Nobody knows that this actually exists. So I'm really happy that at least we're talking about it. Okay. Crazy. So what's, you know, like how do, how do artists normally get into storyboarding? What's the typical career path in this micro industry? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's another really cool question because they're, like I said, it's, it's actually, and now I think it's starting to get better known, right? I'm kind of joking here because people know that story artists exist now. I think it's more common, but what is what is what has been traditionally been the popular things to get into have been concept art uh development work we're actually doing graphic stuff in exactly like yes yeah like modeling and and, and sculpture yeah. and that kind of stuff right so that's really famous people know about that and they also know about animators they're like oh i want to be an animator because they yes. move and they come to life but nobody well I, like i said i think it's getting more popular but there's a, there's another category that's actually very important which is the story artist the story team <laughs> And these are the guys that also use visual language, right? They're, they're artists, they're graphic yeah. people, right? And they draw and they use those kinds of techniques, and, but they do it to communicate the story and tell the story. So how you get into this is um, when you have to enjoy that process. So I, I started, I actually started it's out- It's a good start, manager. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, it's like you want to, you got to be, you got to love it. Like you really got to love it. I mean, there isn't- um, there's no way to explain it. It's like, I, when I got into this stuff, I didn't go in for the money. I didn't want to be famous. Like there's nothing there, you know, it's just don't, don't go in thinking that you're going to have like this crazy success because you're probably setting yourself up for failure, right? If you want to make money, <laughs> go become a banker, right? If you want to uh, be famous, I don't know, go kill the president, whatever. Like, <laughs> well, actually don't do that. How about <laughs> do something else and you do a stupid YouTube video with a cat and you're going to be famous, right? Um, but anyway, the, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get out in a joking way is that you've got to do this for the right reasons. You really have yeah. to love it and love art because when it's difficult, it really is difficult to, um, to get into this business. And when, when things get challenging, you still have to love the process and fall in love with it. Now, on the flip side, and I always say this too, because and, and I'll get to how you can actually do this in a very concrete, actionable, actionable way. But... Uh, the flip side of this is there's more jobs than ever in this area, whether you want to be a story person or whatever, but in just visual arts in general, right? VR, video games, movies, TV, like look at the stuff on Netflix and episodic, uh, you know, shows that are out there. Every single one of them requires visual artists and also story artists. Most of them will require these kinds of people to produce okay. these shows, right? In one form or the other. Um, so on that side, yes, you can make a living and you can be, <laughs> you know, a successful artist. Okay. Um, now how you get into this is you have to, you have to, one, you have to love it. You got to get that. The other one is you got to train yourself. You have to learn the techniques some way. Now there are many ways you can learn the techniques. You can go to a traditional art school. You can go to a university. You can find somebody who's going to be a mentor, who's going to actually train you and teach you the ropes. And I always um, use this example. It's like, if you want to learn a, a language on your own, like say I want to learn Japanese or something like that, I could probably figure it out with a couple books and maybe, I don't know, videos nowadays or whatever. But it's going to be way easier if somebody actually takes me and trains me and tutors me. Of course. How to actually, yeah. right? It's a shortcut. 
together. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, you can spend like uh, years reading the same books and uh, not knowing if you're even moving the right direction. Exactly. And so this, would ha this is what happens with story guys. And I've seen it over and over again. People have really good uh, art skills. So maybe they learn how to draw. They love drawing characters and people and all that kind of stuff. But now they have to learn a second um, or actually let's say multiple techniques, which is taking those drawing skills and learning the story and film language that you're going to use to create a, um, to create a project. And yeah. there's things that we talk about, which is uh, staging and uh, composition. And I'm sure, I'm sure you're familiar with this and your audience is probably familiar with this stuff, but like staging, for example, is the arrangement of characters and your camera in your scene and doing that in a really cool and innovative way. Now, I think we, um, we inherently know this because we've yeah. seen very movies, we've seen like a lot of cool examples that we're familiar with, but when you actually do it, <laughs> is the, what, that's when it's really hard because you, you're sitting there like, wow, I, how do I, what do I do now? I just got these yeah. two guys in a room. Is one guy going to just like start flipping or he's going to punch the other person? Like, how do we actually move them? And that's where, that's where we come in, basically. We have to bring our own sensibilities to the scene and as, a, as you would in a, in a theater, right, on a yeah. stage as like a stage director, you don't just want the actors just standing there in front of the audience. Yeah. You want them to interact with each other. You want them to move around a little bit on the stage. Same thing goes with, um, with the film or a, you know, any kind of project. And the more interesting you move these characters around, the most likely the more visual interest, the more yeah, visual interest you'll bring to your project. Okay. Um, so just to give you a quick summary real quick is what you need are drawing skills, you need, some, uh, you need some film language knowledge, which is like watching movies, studying film, understanding the structure. Uh, also writing is a really good thing to, to understand about uh, dialogue and story structure yeah. and the, the three act, classic three act structure. And the, the tool that you're gonna use to communicate is always gonna be your foundational art skills and drawing skills. And I, I even say this too, for those who are doing 3D and using th something like Previs, right? So, that's another thing that for those that aren't familiar with this previs is like a 3d version of a storyboard you actually yeah. you're using 3d characters and 3d backgrounds and you're moving them around and you're timing out cameras and stuff right so uh even with that you have to have really good composition and you have to have an eye for the camera and understand where things are in relation to everything else okay so that's where your artistic training will come into place and that's also just really important you have a strong foundation Right, I see. Thank you, Sergio. This is a really, really cool summary. So, which actually brings me to the next question. So, okay, like assuming you learn all the techniques as an artist, oh, like as a storyboarding art artist, like what actually makes a good one? Like actually, like what, what is the difference in between just uh, a story, just a storyboard artist and like somebody who's like really successful at their job? Yeah, I have a, I have my opinion about that question because now that I've become a director and I've been able to kind of work with other people, um, I see this, uh, there's a lot of different styles that I see. And one of the things that I find is a really good trait in somebody who's a strong story artist is the curiosity to solve on their own with their own, without any outside input, to solve on their own and just have a, a self editing technique where they're able to analyze the, the, the challenge, the problems, right? Yeah. So we'll call them story problems. So basically you're given a blank page, so to speak, right? <laughs> um, you, you know, you start with something, but you have like, let's say you have two random characters that are supposed to meet at a train station, for example. But within that, and they're supposed to say a couple lines of dialogue, but you don't know what should happen at the train station. So does one like lose their bag? Do, does one arrive late? Is the other one fighting with somebody? This is where you have to come up and use your own interpretation and your own style how to figure out those problems. So the best story guys that I really enjoy working with are the ones that can fully uh, solve those story problems and go at those challenges uh, head on. Like they're wow. the ones who are going to, yeah, they're the ones who are really gonna do their research and analyze films that they've seen before, maybe really take a lot of notes when it comes to talking with the director and the writer. And then what they do when they go back to their desk and they start conceptualizing this, they're going to imagine every single possible scenario and pick the one that works best for that particular set of characters and that story. 
And what's that based on? That's based on their own instincts. It's also based on what they feel the characters should do. So um, let me use an example here of like, uh, let me see, let me pick random characters. Like uh, we've been doing these exercises in some of the courses that we're doing, like pick Superman, right? Most people know who Superman is, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, he's a good guy, you know, he's, he's got, you know the things that he would do and you know the things that he probably wouldn't do, right? Just as a character, he's got, he's got a certain like limitation, certain attitude. So using those benchmarks, you're going to have to create um, a scenario where that character will fit in that world. And that's what a good story artist will do. They'll really think about that and try and understand how this character will react in that world and give it to the audience in a really cool and interesting way. So um, I know wow. that sounds like a bunch of theory. No, right? like, it, sounds actually, I, I, it, it actually sounds pretty practical to me and it actually also sounds like an eye opener because I thought like before uh, that all of those are the director decisions or maybe uh, screenplay decisions. Um, I would never guess that uh, something here can be decided by a story artist. Yes, actually, that's very true. That's very common that people think it's Very that. common, I'm sure. Yeah, and there are directors. There are directors that will make all of those decisions. Um, that, that's, that's true. But what in the reality, of, uh, most film directors or, or TV directors, anybody doing this stuff, they're so busy. They just of don't course. have enough time, right? They don't have enough time to actually sit down and say, okay, this camera is going to be here. This character is going to do this, this and that. So what they do is they, they bring a team together. And this is where the story guys come in and they say, okay, I need you to solve this problem. You have to solve this opening scene. Go. Right. You know, they might give you some more notes. Okay. Right? But basically yeah. Of course. That. I imagine there is feedback after and there is oh, yeah, like, exactly. and there are revisions and, but like, it's really interesting to <laughs> even think that somebody puts it in front of the director first, that it's not like pre-decided, uh, I guess, right, by the script. Yeah, and then, you know, the director is the one who will approve it and will kind of give the, the final, you know, say on everything. And yeah, you're right, there are a lot of revisions. Of course, <laughs> we, yeah. Sometimes we wrong. call it, there's like a joke, it's like storyboarding, right? Storyboarding, there's the RE in the middle of it, because you have to reboard and do it again and do it again. <laughs> yeah. And like th that process happens all the time. Um, and But that's part of the process, because you want to get to, a really cool solution um, but yeah we 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 are I would say this is obviously I'm biased but I say we're really important in the in the <laughs> film industry and we're really important actually I should say yeah we are super important so I have of a job course. right <laughs> so that uh, you know it continues but yeah it's true that somebody's got to make these decisions otherwise no of course a, a really yeah bland thing so the, the other thing that's really cool that I always say is like as soon as you know this stuff it's like it's like you get bit by a bug and you just can't stop telling a story like you're always thinking about okay this. you can't unlearn that right and the, to me it's like the, the emotional basis of what the characters are doing in a film is so important and when you see that and you can manipulate the audience in a way where like they get excited about something and like oh yeah it's like you're waiting for it you're waiting for it whenever you watch a movie and you're like oh man i don't know what's gonna happen this is really cool and you design it in such a way where it's like grabbing the audience and you get that laugh or you get that excitement or like the fear if it's a horror movie or something, somebody jumps, right? Yeah. When you, when you get that feeling, it's just like, it's like you've been bitten by this bug that's so <laughs> addictive, right? And that's all you want to be doing is thinking about stories and how you can make this creative and just do it. It's so thrilling to do that. It's Crazy. Really, really yeah. That's that actually does sound a lot of fun. So talking about importance, um, I really wanted to ask what kind of projects do you need storyboard artists and what kind of projects don't need story artists. So I'm just I guess I'm I'm trying to understand better the scope and maybe um, I don't know if it's about the lens because you mentioned all of the you know like huge studios and that's probably you know like an easy shot. But like, do you for example use story artists for commercial? Yes. Well, it depends. Like. When you, it's kind of a loaded question because you say, what projects don't need story artists? And in my argument is that every product should- Of course, then it's just gonna get better. <laughs> right, and okay, the, the, the truth is, somebody's gotta have to, to make these decisions. So let's say you're on a commercial. That's a really good example, actually. So a commercial project is probably shorter, there's probably less of a budget. So you may not have an opportunity to hire a story person who's gonna create these things in images. Um, maybe that's one of the projects that but, but what you have to do as a creator or as somebody who is working on that project, you have to know what your end result is going to be. And you have to be able to think about it and conceptualize it in your head. So 
Maybe it's the director, maybe it's the cinematographer, because it's the actual guy holding the camera who's telling people, okay, stand there, move there, do that, the light should go here. Um, and, but somebody's got to make those decisions, right? So I would say uh, anytime you have, anytime you have, you have like a big team of people and a very complex uh, project. So this would go, uh, most of the time, animated projects are usually always storyboarded. And there's a reason for that is because you need to figure out beforehand what your final shots are going to be so that you save money. Otherwise, you're just going to animate yeah. forever and you, you have nothing, like you don't have the story yet. And I think, um, I know I'm biased on this, but I, 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 would, I would bet for anybody to argue against me on this one. I think the story is the most important thing on any project. You can have great animation, but if you have a terrible yeah. story, you still have a bad story, no matter how good that animation is, right? So the, the same thing goes with effects, even acting, right? You have like, how many movies have you seen like really quality actors? Oh, yes. And they're in garbage movies, right? Yeah, <laughs> the I'm just like thinking of at least five examples simultaneously in my head. <laughs> yeah, it's all about the story. Like I, I really yeah. can't challenge you on this, unfortunately. <laughs> And the, the, so then what you have to do, this is why, and it doesn't have to be a story guy. It doesn't have to be like somebody me, like me who's like actually drawing something, but somebody who should know about storytelling and know about um, how you create an excitement with images, uh, no matter what you use. So if you're doing, um, let's say if you're a 3D guy and you may not draw as well, but you should still have a, a really good idea of what makes for entertaining content, okay? And that way, um, uh, you can get away with with not having a story team, but I would say any project that has a decent budget and has a, actually that's one of the reasons why because the budget is on the line. So if you have hundreds of thousands of dollars or even millions of dollars on the line, you really want to make sure that you're making the right decision in the yeah. most efficient way, right? Yeah. So you're not wasting money, and that's where the story team comes in because we're actually. I mean, I know you have to pay salaries and stuff, but we're actually on the cheap end, okay? Unfortunately, <laughs> I say we should be we should be like superstars because I want I want that billing. But um, it's actually really cheap and and effective to to do storyboards to make a drawing and redo it and redo it and redo it until you get it, the story right. That phase is actually a lot cheaper than hiring Brad Pitt or somebody like super expensive to come yeah. on to your to your project or like. Visual effects artists are really expensive because there's there's it takes a lot of time and there's many of them. So um, yeah. you know, to big big explosions or whatever, you have to pay a really big you know well a relatively you know costs are coming down lately, but like you know you still have. Guys but still, who it's an rendering. important budget. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's a big budget item to have like effects on it. So yeah. you have to make sure that you're doing you're making the right choices for your story, and that's where the story guys come in. So. Um, yeah, I, you can get away with it, but I would argue for people out there, just make sure that you're doing something really cool and innovative and you've thought about it. Don't just go randomly thinking, I'm going to make some like avant-garde film and, or, you know, I'm just going to start at one end, I'm going to end up at the other because most yeah. likely what you're going to come up with is not as strong uh, as if you had actually pre-planned it and thought about it beforehand. Right. And that's kind of the process that we've done let's say to a professional level yeah right? so um like i know that now you're working on a, a short movie or a movie yourself as a director like in a slightly different capacity not yes. just as an artist can you tell me a little bit more about that i don't know that like that yeah. much of detail that's great actually and it's all kind of related because i think i mentioned before that i i started as an animator i got into story and like i really loved it and then story being in the story department led me into directing uh, because you know, after a while you have enough experience and you can, you know, people will see that you can lead a team and you can have a better control over the, of the story. And because I got into that, then I wanted to do my own things. And so the, the recent project I'm working on is a, it's a live action narrative VR short film. And oh. uh, yeah, so it's a little bit complex. There's a lot of like moving parts here. We're going to do this in virtual reality and we're also going to have a 2d version of, as well. So we'll get, you know, more people to look at it but the the part is just doing a uh, innovative sequential art film and it's about a it's basically about a street performer who can bring his imagination to life and he ends up inspiring an other frustrated artist and giving her his powers and it's a short but it's a very creative um you know kind of whimsical short 
and there are visual effects involved and I did storyboard this myself and I had a lot of people help me as well. But we're in the process of doing the post-production. So we did the principal shooting. We shot it in San Francisco a couple of years ago. And, uh, and now we're actually uh, going through the shots and doing the, the post-production process. So now I've, I've kind of transitioned from, let's say the pre-production side of things yeah. mostly. But then now I'm, I'm, I'm getting into more things that, are, that have to do with conceptualizing the whole project. And I really, I really love this part because it's actually very creative still. And it, it's very much related to the training that I've had as a story guy. And um, cool. I've also been doing some live action projects too and some kind of writing things. So it's all, it's all really related to that like story foundation. You know? Yeah. So how different is it uh, working on somebody else's story versus creating a storyboard for your own uh, short? <laughs> Man, I actually think it's easier to work on other people's <laughs> stuff uh, because when you're when you're doing your own work and i don't know if you guys have found this or maybe your audience can relate to this is like you end up just overthinking and and just not committing Definitely. to things whereas if you're working for somebody else for whatever reason and you know i've been this has been ingrained in me i've been you know it's a pro you got to show up on time you got to be responsible and all these things so when i get hired by somebody like i'm there i'm on it and they like they tell me the idea I'm like okay go and i just do it i'm, I'm like firing off all of the solutions Whereas if I'm working on my own stuff, I like think about it. Oh, no, I don't like that. Let's try something else. And so that same discipline of working for other people, I think it's important to apply that to your own projects. This short that I worked on was, was a long time coming. I, I thought about this idea over many years. In fact, some, some of my friends were making fun of me because it took so long. <laughs> but I actually, you know, I finally get, got to it and we're going to produce the final thing. But um, the, the other thing I will say about doing your own work versus to working with other people this is where it gets really exciting because to me, I think many people, many artists out there have this uh, desire or dream to develop their own concepts and bring them to life. And yeah. that's one of the things that I'm finally able to do uh, as an artist. Now you can do this in your own way. You can create you know, a beautiful oil painting or a nice sculpture or do whatever and bring that to life. But one of the things that I fell in love with is just like um, sequential art and creating motion pictures and films so that you can share that with other people. I just, that emotional ride that you get over time uh, is much more exciting than, to me at least, than just doing a still painting, for example, right? Yeah. So that's where that emotional like grasp of, of watching a, a sequential art film is, is really cool. And doing it, being able to say that like, I was the one to conceptualize these ideas. And you know, and it's not just me, right? So even if you're working by yourself, most of the time you still have to have a team of people. You have to have others help you out. And, but really you're the one guiding the process. And that's where, um, you know, you become what they call the director, right? As somebody who is directing the idea. It doesn't mean you do everything. It just mm -hmm. means that you are, let's say the principal person in charge of overseeing the, the consistency of the style of the project. And that, for, for, for those of you guys out there who are listening, is really, really fun. <laughs> it is thrilling. It is really, really cool. And I, I hope everybody have the opportunity one time in their career to try it, to maybe do a short film or do a project on their own and see how it goes because uh, you learn so much. It's just like the, the experience is like nothing else. It's like 100 film schools all in one. <laughs> I really love how you made this transition, you know, from actually, you know, being a commercial artist in a way. So working on somebody else's stuff and just, you know, fulfilling, let's say, an important, but like one bit of the process, but then eventually to owning the whole, the whole thing. Um, and, you know, with the same skill, but kind of a becoming like the proprietary artist. Yeah. Um, like, just I, I really love that it's uh, um, and I hear people talk a lot about oh we're just commercial artists but in the end of the day that's not a ceiling yeah I think you know we all want to I, I think I, I hear this a lot from a lot of artists and friends and stuff it's like we all want to do our own stuff yes yeah. there's, there's a there's a there's a way to do it that and again I don't know all the answers but like let's say at least in my own career path like you have to learn the foundation. You got to learn the, the technique, the skill. You have to become the artist eventually. So it becomes second nature. So you no longer think about technique. You become the one being creative spontaneously because you're, yeah. you're so good at it, right? Think about riding a bike. You're like, you can jump now because you, you already know how to pedal. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right? So, so then, uh, 
So then once you get that done, you, you also have to have a, a runway, right? And in today's modern world, I think a lot of this runway represents like economic freedom. So you have to be able to save up money to be able to like, you know, don't spend a lot, don't, don't get like big into debt and, and buy stupid things because you're, if you're really into your art, you want to be focused on that and, and set yourself up so that you can dedicate your training and your focus to doing these art projects, which, and then this is, this is the hard part, by the way, this is good stuff to talk about because I bet many people can relate. Everybody around you is going to tell you, no, they're going to be like, your parents are going to be like, what are you doing? You're crazy. I can't believe yeah, you're yeah, doing yeah. art, right? <laughs> uh, your friends are going to be like, man, you're not going to make any money doing that. Are you, what are you, you're crazy. And, and the opposite is true. If you actually do this in every single example in my own career that I've done this and I've put a hundred percent effort in my own projects and my stuff, the end result has always been successful. And, and let me define that a little bit because it's also, it's not just successful in the fact that I, I completed it. It's also successful in the fact that I got paid, like I got money back by doing these things or it opened up other career opportunities that didn't exist before because I, because I, uh, because I hadn't done this stuff yeah, before. Yeah. Right. And I think that's one thing that uh, people lose sight of, and maybe they get overcome by fear or the other people's doubts <laughs> because yeah, they, you know, this and they the do ladder. this, and, you know, right. You know, your fa- friends and your parents or whoever they're doing this, you know, most of the time in good faith to actually protect you and make you, you know, you know, just be cautious. But there's something I think to be said about, uh, organizing your life and planning your, your strokes, let's say your movements, your steps, so that you can, you can do the things eventually that you want to do. And for many people, that's different. Like you might want to work with a group of people or a studio in particular, like, yeah. you know, go to Blizzard or go to Blur or something like that. Um, but uh, other people, it might be just, I just want to do my own short film. I want to create my own series of, uh, of action figures. or I want to do my own t-shirt line or something, you know, fashion line, something like that. That's great. I think there are ways to do it so that you can be smart and successful at mm-hmm. that and also be creative, uh, creatively fulfilled. Yeah. Right? I definitely love your concept of the runway. So just uh, creating this thing that will allow you eventually to like, just, just total freedom. And yeah. And it's different. It's different for every artist. I mean, we all come from different backgrounds and different countries and, uh, and eventually even our art is different. And yeah. Then- and that, it, that's really hard sometimes because, and I, you know, cause since I run in like an online courses to teach people how to do this stuff, I, a lot of, a lot of questions that comes up, like, what, you know, I'm not from the United States. What, what can I do? I don't have the education. I don't have the money to do this stuff. You know, how can I get started in this business? And this is where I would say, go to Art Heroes, you know, learn what they're teaching you, right? Because it's the, now more than ever, the playing field has been leveled, right? Before you had to go to like a really expensive four-year school to learn any kind of art skills or find some super awesome pro that lived halfway across the world that could teach you this stuff. Now you can actually do what we're doing now is, you know, yeah, it's online, like, you can, right? they, yeah. And then you can learn storyboarding, you can like learn character art, you can learn anything pretty much in the in a very measurable time and with very measurable money, I think. It's just definitely not how much I paid for the university. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, or or me. And so like, I I would do it all over again. Oh my God. (laughs) And and so, you you know, one way to do it so that you, if if that's when your end goal is to have a runway and to be able to do your own things, is just be really smart about the choices that you're making. You know, like, and I'm speaking to like the young artists out there who want to get into this. It was like, you know, but just, just understand what your end goal is and see how you can figure out your path to that. Yeah. And there are ways to get there. And there's so many, like if you take that challenge out there and you're really curious about it, you can, you know, you can mentor with your local pro. You can sign up to an online school. You can, uh, you know, yeah. make a group of friends that are interested in the same thing. And out of that, you're going to, one, you're going to hopefully enjoy that process. And then two, you, you might find success that way. And it would be, hopefully economic success and also artistic success as well. Yeah, definitely. And it just starts with like closing the gaps. Like if you don't know how to like do this technically, well, you definitely like can learn that. And then just like little by little and then uh, advance until you get there. Kind of, a, yeah. yeah, easier these days, right? 
<laughs> yeah, it's easier. I mean, it's still hard, right? I, I think it's not like, oh, I, you know, turn on the computer or look on my phone online and I'm suddenly amazing. No, you got to do the work. You, you have to yeah, put yeah, in yeah. the work and learn this stuff. Like it doesn't happen overnight. Like I've been pro artist for now and like going on 25 years or so. And it was really, really hard at the beginning. Hard in the sense where like I had to work every single day. It's like going to the gym or going to the dojo and practicing your Kung Fu, right? You got to learn this in order to become eventually yeah. like a master. And, um, and I'm still not there yet, right? I'm still yeah. have to learn every single day. And that's like, you just gotta, that's why I say you gotta love it. Cause if, if you're not enjoying the process, you're not gonna wanna put your heart into it. Oh my God, Sergio, that was a lot of information and a lot of great insight. But before I wrap up actually, um, we have a little tradition here and uh, it's a quick, uh, 10 question questionnaire. So if you're okay. ready, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put you through this a miserable experience. Okay, cool. <laughs> Are these like rapid fire questions that I like answer them? The well, first thing that comes to my head or? Yeah, kind of. You've got a, a phrase to answer. So, okay, okay. um, yeah. So ready when you are. Yeah. Go Good? for it. Okay. Okay, let's go. So what's your number one tip for combating distractions when working from home? Oh man, that's what I'm working on right now is battling distractions. <laughs> um, okay, I got it. I got it. I got the answer. Wake up early. And for artists out there, it's really hard. But I'm telling you, if you wake up at four or five in the morning, nobody else in the house is awake and you have those block of hours to produce and actually think, it's just that get into your mindset and do it. Now what you have, you have to go to bed early. Okay. You can't just okay. stay up <laughs> until 2 a.m. <laughs> and expect to wake up at five. At five and, yes. <laughs> yeah. And this is really hard for myself personally. So, but I'm, I'm getting there, but that's my tip. Wake up early. I totally second that. Totally second that. Like right, it's, cool. it, this is, this is, this does magic to me as well. Yeah. Um, so your favorite tradition or holiday. Ooh, uh, I like, uh, I actually like Halloween. Uh, oh, wow. Because yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think it's probably a common answer, but uh, there's actually recently there's cool stuff. It's like October has the Inktober, which is like <laughs> yes. uh, a contest that people do to draw. And uh, and then all of the cool creative costumes that come out of that. And then recently I discovered a uh, uh, a really awesome sculptor that is actually local to where I'm, I'm living right now who does these amazing pumpkin sculptures with oh. during Halloween. So all of like, that like together. actual like actual physical pumpkins. Yeah, yeah. He'll carve oh. into a pumpkin and create oh. the most amazing things. I don't have his name off the hand, off hand, but I'll have to dig it up. Maybe I can send you the link. Yeah. Oh my God. This actually yeah. sounds pretty cool. All yeah, right. They're, they're awesome. Good. Uh, next one. Uh, what's your favorite way to get in some exercise? Exercise. Ooh. Uh, okay. This is another one where like you got to work the discipline. My favorite thing is because, and the reason I got into this, let me give a quick background is, sure. um, uh, when I, I, I worked at Skywalker Ranch when I was working on Lucasfilm and that kind of stuff, it was awesome. It's like working at a country club because it was, the <laughs> facilities were amazing. They had tennis courts, basketball courts, they had a full gym. So me and a couple other buddies would go work out in the middle of the day at noon. And it was from like 12 to one, we'd work out and then afterwards we'd grab lunch and then we'd eat at our desk and continue the work day. That was so much fun because we'd go to the swimming pool, we'd play basketball, we'd like lift weights and do that kind of exercise, strength training. So now my favorite way to get some exercise in is just lock it in 12 noon. I'm like out the door, either go for a jog or uh, I have wow. some like strength training equipment at home. And, you know, I, I do that in my garage and uh, that's the best way to do it. I, yeah, just perfect. I, I get out of the day. It wakes me up. It's like, <laughs> it's, it works wonders. It really does. <laughs> okay. I've got to try that. I've got to try that. It sounds cool. All right. Yeah. Next. What's your most used emoji? Ooh, uh, I'm kind of basic. I just give a happy face. <laughs> colon, colon, okay. uh, and shift, shift zero. That's all. Yes, exactly. All right. So, what's the worst haircut you've ever had? Ah, oh man, my friends <laughs> would make fun of me if they. <laughs> so, my close friends, at least, have known I've had a ton of like random hair throughout my life. So I've had like long hair, I've had blue hair, I've had like really. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to see any of those examples. <laughs> 
I think the worst haircut I had, and this my friend pointed this out. He's like, man, this is because we we were looking at pictures when I worked at a video game company in San Diego, and he's like, dude, what what happened to your hair here? <laughs> I I had it. I tried it. I grew it long, and I had it straightened. So it was like this. It looked like this punk kind of thing. It was terrible. It was really bad. Like don't. I tried everything, but you know, whatever. Was, I was in that phase. <laughs> okay. Oh my god, that that really made me laugh. Okay, I can't even imagine that. All right. Yeah, yeah. Great. You don't want to see any of those pictures. <laughs> All right, great. So, um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Man, that's uh, that's kind of a hard one. I think uh, I have to dig around. Like, change so your many... hair. Yeah, change. Yeah, don't <laughs> don't do these funky haircuts. Um, I'd probably say, you know, like I'm trying to see a practical one. There's one that's like, uh, I think it's really just like being consistent. Like one, like one teacher I remember was saying that all you have to do is just draw 20 minutes a day. That's all you have to do and just keep it really basic. And I think you could apply that to anything, but I apply it to art, let's say, is just keeping it as consistent as possible because it's not, it's not a race. Like to me, I think of this as a marathon, even your whole life, you can apply this to your life, right? So being patient is actually a virtue that and I, I call it, I think everybody has superpowers. And uh, I think one of my so-called superpowers that I think I have is one, I can, I can find anything on the internet. I'm really good at searching stuff on the internet. It's one of my random superpowers. <laughs> the other one is actually, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm really patient. And, um, and so uh, just being very consistent every day, putting in the work, and just being consistent about doing the work. And I think I learned that from another teacher that, that kind of instilled that in me. That he, and he made it seem easy. That was the whole key was that like, yeah. just all you have to do is 20 minutes, that's it. Exactly. And, uh, and it really doesn't hurt and you can, you can get it done. So just like your exercise or I call it like dojo training with your art. Yeah. If you do it, you do it every day. And, and it's done and you feel better afterwards you really do i absolutely love that i absolutely love that yeah i do something <laughs> actually really similar with my exercise routine i just tell myself that i have to run for five minutes every day just five oh, minutes oh there you go see yeah that's just it. five yeah. minutes no more yeah. i never run less than 25 eventually but yeah but, <laughs> but get, i always get say the that like if i really it's... feel like it's just five minutes yeah definitely it does work cool yeah um okay so um, if you had your own, if you, if you were to design your own t-shirt, what, do, what would you put in it? Mm -hmm. My own t-shirt would probably be like one of these. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, bird. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I'm trying to think if I, I would probably have some, I guess I'd probably have to be creative and do some kind of art thing. But if I had a message, it would probably be, uh, it would probably be, so this is pretty cliche, but it would probably be something like, like uh, that old Apple commercial, like think different, right? right? And, you know, because, I would just think, how about that? Just, just, just think, <laughs> don't even think different, just think at all. And I oh think my God, this is amazing. This really actually applies to <laughs> artists because what we have to do, and I think as artists, we have to think outside the box because you don't want to do what everybody else has done before you. You yeah. got to learn from what everybody else has done before you. But then when you get down to work, you have to say, how can I do this in my own way? How can I do this? Differently? Think. Think different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just think. Yeah. Like, let's start with the basics. All right. Amazing. So if you were to, to see one movie again for the first time, which one would you watch? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, that's how I get my, you know, like to watch list. Oh, but I'm going to take you to like really cheesy movies that you may not want to see again. Sure. Yeah, just give me one. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I have, this is, this is actually a really hard question for me because uh, I have a list of movies that I really like that are my favorites, but all, all of it is, most of it is influenced by my childhood and stuff. But I think um, one movie that you wouldn't think is, uh, it would be on that list is uh, something like, I think um, the first one that comes to mind is like Robocop. And the, the reason I say that, and I don't think many people realize it, when that came out in like 84, 85, I think, um, it was really groundbreaking, especially for me as a kid, because it was super gory and it was like tons of blood and like, uh, and it was just a really over the top film, which like 
the film director Verhoeven is famous for doing, right? He did Starship Trooper, yeah. he did um, he's certainly Robocop, and he did Total Recall, and just every one of his films has like this social commentary and just like this weird edge to it that I find actually really fun. And uh, I remember it was shocking. Like I remember when like it, there's there's a scene where somebody gets yeah. melted. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're like, oh my god, I can't believe this is <laughs> this is for real. Uh, I would say that, or like maybe Nightmare on Elm Street is another one. Okay. Like, uh, as, as, a, as a shocker when I first no noted noted well and the last one um what's your absolute dream job i guess i know the answer right mm, yeah <laughs> the dream, dream job would be me working for myself where somebody else is paying for me to do my own films <laughs> and it, which is you know it's probably almost like a pipe dream but i think i think that the, probably the a more truthful answer would be that every day I get to, uh, that, you know, somebody is paying me, somebody is, uh, I shouldn't say pay, I should say somebody is, is, uh, is sponsoring me, right? Okay. Hopefully in an economic way, they're sponsoring me to be creative and do uh, creative work. So that just like, and I, if you think about this, this is what happened in like Picasso's life. If you look back at, you know, if you ever research and want to dig into somebody like Pablo Picasso, is that, when he was like oh, yeah, really yeah. early, mm -hmm. right? When he was really early, he got sponsored. He had a patron who really liked his work. And I forgot her name, but uh, she was some socialite from Europe, from France, I think. And uh, she started buying his work. And then at that, from then on, he was, he was free to do whatever he wanted because he was being sponsored, so to speak, at a patron or many patrons who would purchase his work. And the creativity that I think exploded from there, he was just wildly creative doing all kinds of cool stuff. So I think of that as like, that would be my dream job is that to have my whole lifestyle designed so that the, as I wake up and do the things that I want to do, that the only thing I'm doing all day long is just being creative. That would be wow. my, my total dream job. <laughs> wow. Well, I love the, you know, I definitely love the concept and uh, um, I think, you know, it all starts from putting the goal out there, right? So like picturing, yeah. picturing the image and then just kind of, you know, like setting the bricks and how to get there bringing this to the uh, yes. to what we spoke about just before so you know like step one done <laughs> i like it yes yeah i love that too laura sergio thank you so much for coming on the show we're just like perfect right on time and uh sorry if i took, kept you here for too long no my pleasure this is really fun thank you <laughs> all right me. yeah all yeah. right cheers thanks for okay. coming again see ya bye. bye thanks for listening to art heroes mm. podcast Check out www.artheroes.co for show notes, more interviews, and free tools made for you by our team of mentors. Tune in next week for more inspiration, and keep up the great work, hero.